legislative history being uh, looking at the activists who created the environment that allowed the social change to take place in, in America. Uh, the thought is that uh, there are all these people that are a footnote in our history books, they're not there at all, uh, who are really the motivating force for change in this country. Uh, Ida B. Wells is just this amazing woman from Victorian times who just would not stop in her, in her fight against injustice and lynching. Uh, I have three quotes that I've built this program around and which I think describe uh, Ida as well. And, and this is within the cutting of, we, we, we understand that, especially in America, probably everywhere, we live in contradictions and everything is not one way or the other. There, there, there are contradictions in our, in our lives. Um, but my first one is eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. And that's from Thomas Jefferson, who was a great defender of democracy, but also a slave owner. The second quote is, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And that's Edmund Burke, who considered the father of conservatism. So within those two quotes, you know, you need to be aware of what's going on in the world around you, and you need to respond. You, cannot, you need to be a participant in order to control, in order to project society. Uh, the third quote is just, I think, it's the, the perfect statement of principle. It's from Martin Luther King. And it's cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it political? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe nor political nor popular, but one must take it simply because it is right. And I think those principles grow by to be wells and, and are the principles that we should be reaching out for and that should drive, drive our lives uh, today. Um, this is the last of 15 programs in the last 15 days on Ida B. Wells. Uh, it is on uh, the prison system. Ida B. Wells uh, and her husband, her husband was a lawyer. One of the things that's been really confusing to me in, in, in reading about Ida B. Wells is the Republicans are the good guys. Yeah, and, and it's a really <laughs> <laughs> and here she is in Chicago in the 1890s, you know, and you know, I grew up with union history, and you know, uh, the unions are segregated. The unions are, are fighting black workers coming from, from the South. You know, so, so I actually at one point calls on the Republican governor to send troops to protect the train load of black strike breakers coming to a strike in Chicago, and I was rubbing my head at this thing. <laughs> you know, here is this woman who is a voice, a, a, an unrelenting voice for, for freedom and equality and justice, and, and you know, of all my training said, no strike breakers are wrong. <laughs> you know, but here, the, you know, I was talking to Henry Nichols, they said, you know, the union movement and the struggle for African American equality are two parallel movements. And they don't come, they're not always together. There's sometimes a conflict. You know, there's another set of contradictions that, that you kind of have to get your mind around. But one of her, one of the her amazing events in her life is there was, uh, she got married in her 30s, she had four kids, her husband was a lawyer. You know, she's doing all this amazing work in Chicago. And, uh, and she, gets, she gets a call to come to Arkansas because these 12 guys are about to be executed for conspiracy to revolt against the United States. And, and she goes down and she meets with the women, she goes into prison with them, talks to the guys, you know, and they tell her her story and she had documents everything and they sing these songs and they, you know, and then she finds this, wait, look, you know, why are you singing and praying about dying? You should be sitting here <laughs> praying about living. And, and you know, if you believe in your God, why are you praying to Him to open these prison walls, not shepherd you 
a hundred years ago. You know, it, she took it and she wrote a book, a uh, pamphlet called The Arkansas Restaurant. And actually what they were trying to do was form a, a sharecroppers union because basically the, 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 they were stealing because of the cotton from them. They weren't getting, they couldn't get the price they couldn't live. So they were trying to form a union which was attacked and then they were charged with rioting. Uh, and, and so, I mean, she wrote this pamphlet, she got them all in jail, right? And they were all ready to die. And <clears throat> as far as I know, there were recordings of her speeches, but I would love to have heard her speak. I mean, she must have been such a powerful voice. But, but the, the issue of prison and the death penalty and is, is, a, is a continuity of, of control mechanisms from, from the very beginning of, of the enslavement of Africans in this country. And with that, I'll turn it over to Michael Kors to introduce the other people. <laughs> That's Larry Robin Sick. I hate to see him well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was on the uh, warpath, which is a wonderful thing. And let's give Larry a round of applause. all of us. Having said that, I'm sure many of you have the flyer for this afternoon's program, the Continuum of Abuse, Slavery, Black Laws, Contract Labor, Jim Crow, Lynching, Prison Industrial Complex, and Death Penalty. And as Larry pointed out, this is all in connection with Ida B. Wells. And I'm going to let uh, each of the panelists start off with maybe a three to four minute opening statement where we talk about specifically slavery, black laws, contract labor, Jim Crow, lynching, prison industrial complex, death penalty, and tie it in to Ida B. Wells. One of the things I want to make sure we do by the end of this discussion is we offer some solutions. Because often we come together with these great minds here, these great minds out there, we talk about all this great stuff, and then we leave. So we, by the time we end today's uh, panel discussion, we want to offer and propose and discuss uh, a few solutions so that we are a little closer today to some type of justice than we were yesterday. And I see many of my friends out there, some of you should be up here, Dr. Uh, Anthony Montero, one of them. Uh, let's give him a round of applause. Now, I was not with Dr. Montero because he and I had a debate a couple of months ago. He's the only person that ever ties me in the debate, so I got to get him a round of applause. Did a great job. Um, having said that, Again, in the program, I'm going to go uh, from my right to left and uh, just saying um, the names of the panelists and just have them speak a little bit about themselves because there's a few blurbs about each person, but um, I know when people write things about me and say them in panel discussions, usually they get them wrong or they're too long-winded or whatever. So whatever folks want to say, they can say. Starting off my far right, L.B. Gator. Uh, as it indicates, he's an educator, an activist, an independent historian, but probably much more than that. So let him say a little bit about himself and then the stopwatch is on for a three minute opening stage. Well, uh, I'm a little bit more than that. I'm a father, activist, educator. And uh, with that being said, I'm also the author of the book here. I'm not here to sell the book, but I want to let you know that this is the book. I've also been part of this name of the book. Here. With me. That's probably the reason why I'm here to point out to you. But um, the other question I wanted to come here and, and uh, answer tonight, is get an answer from you all, is why do you still have a death penalty? And for me, uh, to be able to come and sit on a panel uh, giving honor to the legacy of Ida B. Wells is just something I could not pass up. That's why I'm here in Philadelphia, up south in Philadelphia. To uh, be a part of this panel. Um, in Texas, we, since the death penalty has been reinstated in 1974, we have, the te state of Texas has almost executed 500 people. Okay. So we're talking about a, different, a national struggle, it's an international struggle against the death penalty, but we're talking about something very particular when we talk about death penalty in Texas cannot get around. So anybody from Texas could come up here and sit on the panel. And I'm not trying to say that Texas gives you the reason why you're here. That's 
got to understand that I want to talk a little bit more about that if we get into the discussion. The three things I wanted to really talk about today also are leadership, uh, racism within the movement, and also not understanding, conceptualizing uh, the death penalty as it relates to prisons, education, and, uh, and also edu uh, and also capital punishment, all those things, how they tie together. So we'll go more in detail about those issues as we go further. I think I could easily go past three minutes, and uh, I don't want to do that. But. Well, actually, I actually have a stopwatch, and uh, he was 16 minutes short, so he was good. 16 minutes? 16 seconds. 16 oh. seconds. I'm sorry. Okay, so, so you want to use your 16 seconds? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. 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 And thanks for having me here. We'll get more into it as we move further on. And uh, our next panelist, as the material indicates, is Sandra J. Jones, in case you're also, but once more, she's certainly much more than that. So let's hear from Sandra J. Jones. Thank you. History, and I, I feel like she has not gotten her due attention. It's, it's high time we talk more about her, and I'm honored to uh, play a role in that. Obviously, she was a very uncompromising principal woman of her time, from a young child, as you remember, as the, even a teenager, um, being pulled off of the train literally by two people kicking and screaming and biting when she knew she had every right to sit there amongst her white um, counterparts on that train. And she's been a fighter. Uh, throughout her life, and I'm honored to be here to speak on her and the parallels between her work and my work, um, and not just mine, but all of our work in the anti-death penalty movement. I've been an abolitionist um, fighting for the end of the death penalty for nearly two decades now. I come from the South, from Virginia. I live in Delaware now, but I came up here in 93 to go to grad school at Temple University. That's when I learned about the case of Mamiya Abu-Jamal and the Move 9 and the Move family in general and got heavily involved and have been ever since with both of those cases. Um, and through my work with the anti-death penalty movement, and I am on the board of the campaigns and the death penalty. Um, they grew out of work in Chicago and fighting for the rights of Chicago 10. We also do some work in Texas and other places around the country. Um, I'm happy to speak more on that when we have more time. But just in the way of preliminary, preliminary introductions, I will say that there are clear parallels between the history of lynching, uh, lynch law and our nation's history and contemporary death penalty. I mean, strong parallels in where the executions occur. And even though I'm not from Texas, the state that we all know kills people on a very regular basis, in my state of Delaware, we were for a little while there number one in per capita executions. Per capita being the key words, obviously. We've executed 16 people since we reinstated the death penalty in 92. We've fallen to number three still in per capita executions behind Oklahoma and Texas. So it is a very urgent matter in my state, but all around the world, obviously. And I know that um, our colleagues um, in, in Europe look at us and say, still have this death penalty. You know, when I talk to people in European countries, <coughs> yeah, we still do. So it's, it's, I also, also would like to offer, I'm very happy that Michael said we were going to focus on solutions today because, like you all, I get frustrated when we go, we all get pissed off, we talk about how bad things are, and then we just leave and we're frustrated. We need to talk about solutions. And one of the solutions that I spent a lot of my research and work on culminated in this book that's mentioned in the program, the Coalition Building and the anti death Penalty Movement. And that is the reluctance of the contemporary anti-death penalty movement to focus on issues of race. The racial politics around the death penalty are crucial, and we need to not be shy away from them and not be afraid. Uh, the race card, quote unquote, is one that people are reluctant to play in this post-civil rights era, but I say that we, I challenge our movement to more boldly embrace that and talk about it because it's a reality of the death penalty that cannot be ignored and should not be ignored. So. Um, I will you know, talk a little bit about that as well when we have more time. Everybody's so on point. She actually had three seconds left. Three <laughs> seconds. <laughs> um, and we definitely want to be sensitive to the time because we want to give you all an opportunity to uh, say a few things and ask a few things. Um, I guess I'm next up at bat, and I'll just say this about myself. I jokingly, but I guess really seriously describe myself 
as an angry black man, and not just an angry black man, but the angriest black man in America. Um, when you think about anger and why black people are angry, better say why black people should be angry, look at what they've gone through. I remember Reggie Bryant, he used to be on WHAT and then on WRD, he posed a great question. He couldn't understand why many white people had such racial animus toward black people. All we did was work as slaves for you for like 300 years. So it seems to me that the anger should have been from us toward them. Why are you mad at me? And that sounds like a superficial question, but it's really profound when you think about it. You beat us, you lynched us, you raped us, you castrated us, you did all these things, and you're mad at us. Anyway, having said that, um, a person who's listed on the uh, program who's not here, and I wish she were, but I just talked to her last night, and she was actually out of the state. Uh, fighting the good fight as she always does. So if she comes running through here, we'll know that she just left New York to get here to fight the good fight. That's none other than the modern day Ida B. Wells. And that's Pam Africa. Because when you think about Ida B. Wells and you think about Pam Africa, one of the things they have in common is that a lot of people will refer to them as feisty, but that's kind of sexist because you would never refer to a man as feisty simply because he stood up. I refer to them as courageous and heroic. And in the same way that Ida B. Wells, when she was told to get off the train, didn't get off. Pam wouldn't have got off. She didn't wait for them to just kind of walk her to the door. They actually had to pick this woman up after she fought them, and bit them, and scratched them, and kicked them. I mean, she was actually rumbling on the train by herself. And I think that was profound. We're going to talk much more about her. Um, but one of the things I do want to say is, the first two panelists mentioned the death penalty, and I hope we get into that. Um, one of the things I want to say, and I see that I'm like, I don't know, 47 seconds way past my time, but I got the microphone, so that's okay. But I just want to say this. There are people in the community, the, I guess the progressive white community and certainly in the black community, and I was surprised as a death penalty lawyer that so many black people support the death penalty. In fact, there's a greater percentage of black people who support the death penalty than whites. And I couldn't understand that. But then one day, the DA of black people said something to me that I should have realized myself. He said, Mike, you understand that many of the victims of these murders are black. So when these people say they support the death penalty, they're talking about their victimized son and daughter and aunt and uncle. But we have to kind of enlighten them about that what the death penalty is and what it really does. And I'm hoping that here, there are some people, black, white, male, female, gay, straight, whatever, progressive people who would support the death penalty because there has to be some, maybe not, but maybe enlightened people, well no, let me change it, we're not enlightened, but there are some reasonable people who might support the death penalty. And I want to hear from them. I don't want to just preach to the choir today. And I want to hear from those who think that there are some really, really, really bad people who commit some really, really, really bad crimes who ought to be executed. And if you think they are, we want to hear from you. And one final thing, I give me one final thing I'll say before I turn the microphone over is this. As a defense attorney, when I have death penalty trials, the first thing the system does is bring in about 60 people. And of those 60 people who come to court, when the lawyers have to go back and forth and select 12 jurors and two alternates. The first question that's always asked at every what we call voir dire is, anybody here opposed to death penalty? All the other <coughs> people, conscious and progressive people raised their hand, and now they're done. They're gone. So this is what I want to say, because this is being recorded, I can get in trouble if I advocate nullification. Nullification is when a lawyer or anybody tells people to ignore the law, just nullify it. And if I told you to ignore the death penalty law, then I can get in trouble. So to the person recording this, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that <laughs> hypothetically, when that question is posed to you, you come into that room, and the judge says, is there anybody here who opposes the death penalty? I want you to pause and think about this. Think for a, split, for a few seconds. Think about your sweet little granddaughter or sweet little grandson, infant and some horrible man comes along and kidnaps this person and rapes this person and sodomizes this 
person and tortures this person and ultimately kills this person. When you get the call that somebody did that to your grandson or your granddaughter, for a split second, you support the death penalty. For a split second, you want to kill the person who did this. So when the judge asks you the question, do you support the death penalty, the judge is not asking you for how long you support it. They're just asking you if you support it. So pretend as if you just got the call about this horrific crime involving your loved one, and maybe if that split second, you support the death penalty. But we need enlightened people on the juries. As I pointed out, Ida B. Wells, I mean, Pam Africa, has arrived. So, <laughs> about what's important to us among these topics, and we'll get into more detail. Without further ado, let me introduce to you Brother Shuja Graham. And as it indicates here on this information, here's a man who is not just talking about it, but who lived it. He was on death row. Without further ado, let's give him a round of applause. Thank you all for being here. And, uh, let me just use a few seconds of my moment to recognize Kurt Gordon who was the first DNA person to be exonerated who was on death row. He's from the state of Maryland. <laughs> my friend, who am I? I can't say it all in three minutes, but I will say this. I was born and raised in the South. I was born and raised in a little town called Lake Providence, New Jersey. I grew up on the segregation. When I was a little boy coming up, growing up in the South, we had one black police officer. He was going to arrest black people. And as I left the South and went on off to California, my uncle became a police officer. I'm also a murder victim. That he was killed. That was my mother, my grandmother's best son. So it was difficult. I've had a difficult life and a difficult experience, but I've had a wonderful life, a life of a trail. And I tell people often what I've been through and experience, and they ask me, if you had to do it all over again, what would you, what would you do? Would you do, still do the same thing? I said, the only thing that I'd do different when I came out of my mother's womb, I'd come out fighting. I said, that's my depression. <laughs> so, you know, before I left the South at 11 years old, and I went off to California, that's where my trouble began. I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. As a little boy, I went in and out of jail. For the last time at 18, I went to jail. And I was released from jail when I was 32 years old. I experienced four trials in America, four racist trials. It took me nine years to prove my innocence. For three of those years, I had to go to California to death row. And the worst thing you could ever do is to stand up in a courtroom 18 years old and they tell you you're not fit to live. This is the system that we're fighting against. This system is this is a system that discriminates against people like me. Most of the people that I was on death row with were black people. Most of the people that was on death row, most of the victims were black. That was the reality. The capital punishment haven't solved any of our problems. So I just want to thank you all for being here. We <coughs> can go to capital punishment and yes, the social justice for all the people of the world. Speaking, actually turned off the stopwatch because I mean he could talk as long as he wanted to based on the hell that he's going through. Let's give him another round. <laughs> next, without further ado, I'm going to introduce to you Pam Africa. I could spend the next hour telling you about her, but when I say a modern day Ida B. Wells, I mean that a woman who stands up against injustice and wins. Without further ado, Pam Africa. Minister of Confrontation for the Reorganization and Chairwoman of the Uncompromising International Concerned Family Friends of Mugia Abu Jamal. Um, when I first got involved with the case of Mugia Abu Jamal um, and the death penalty, I thought I was someone who really cared about the work and the you know, free of people from death row. <coughs> and, uh, but my coordinator, John Africa, teaches us that, for instance, when, if I'm thirsty and I want to drink, 
And the only way to do it is not sit there and talk about it, keep saying, I'm thirsty, I want to drink, I want to drink, I want to drink. So you pick this glass up and do that, the action, and all you haven't done anything. So with that, I started doing work around with Mia and the death of, um, and ended the death point. And I found out that I needed to go a whole lot further and get involved with brothers so like Susie and different other brothers and mothers um, <coughs> that was dealing with issues of the death penalty. Then I um, got involved with organizations of family members against the death penalty. And I knew what my job was to do, and that was to bring more people into the work. And part of the things that was happening, a lot of people who didn't believe that the death penalty is right and righteous, I had them join the International Concerned Family Defense of Mooney Abu Jamal. And people said, Pam, you're crazy. And, like, and I would bring them on radio shows because these are the people that we need to reach. We had to reach people who believe that the death penalty is right and show them through examples of pulling them close to us and allowing them to say what it is that they were saying. You know? And you know, a lot of times when we would be on radio shows and things, the people that call in are people that agree with us. You know, we needed people to teach people on the outside who did not have the nerve or the heart enough to stand up and say, I am 100% for the death penalty and I think these people should be executed and state their reasons why. There was a sister by the name of Linda Rayner, and you know, um, who truly believed that way. She is now a abolitionist against the death penalty. She said that she wouldn't give a damn who or she would pull the switch on anybody except Mundia and Mundia Jamal. And you know, she said, I would gladly pull the switch with everybody up here to get This woman, by being with us and meeting mothers of against the death penalty, and uh, you know, and then, as fate would have it, her son was arrested for a murder that he did not commit. And also, uh, I say that to say the work that we do is not only preaching to the choir, and uh, I go outside the lines and I grab those people who 100% believe that the death penalty is wrong, is right. And in the work around Romania, that's what we have done. I don't spoke to the people who think that Mumia is innocent. And some people said, you know, well, the reason why I support Mumia is because I don't think no black man should be, you know, executed. We had to speak to what was happening, you know, there as well in their mind. No one should be executed. And I want to point out, this government dropped a bomb killing 11 innocent men, women, children of my family. No movement through the teachers of John Africa had taught us to call for the death of any of these people, but to call for the death, the mentality of a person who thinks that the right thing to do is to murder. Murder is wrong on any level, and I don't care how you do it, and you cannot perpetuate murder on any level. With that, I'll pass it. to go into uh, more specific with each of the panelists again starting from my far right but as you heard from each of them they all have something powerful to say we heard from uh, my far right brother L.B. Gaither an educator he's going to talk more about the death penalty what I like everybody on the panel to talk about is whether it's about the death penalty or slavery or black laws or contract labor or Jim Crow or lynchings or prison industrial complex we want to tie in Ida B. Wells and make it relevant to her and the work that she did. Um, so at this point, and by the way, we will have an opportunity at the end for folks in the audience to uh, make a comment or to ask a question. And we're going to try to make sure we have the microphone and pass it around. Uh, somebody's gonna hold the microphone and, and walk around. That way, when folks go into a 15 minute dissertation, because know everybody got PhDs and whatever in the audience. So before they start that, we're going to just give you two or three minutes. But having said that, again, we want to tie in Ida B. Wells to the issue of the death penalty. But before that, LB, let me ask you, as I will ask each of the other panelists, let me play the devil's advocate. To the extent that we talk about the death penalty, this is something that the American public, for the most part, 
Polls go back and forth, but some of the most recent polls show that a majority of Americans support the death penalty. Okay. And as a turn for, let me stop you right there. <laughs> and remember, I'm playing the devil's advocate because I'm on the bench. That's a good advocate. Yes, that's a good advocate. But uh, that, that and the fact that so many blacks support. No, that, that's the point I want to bring. No, that's, no. that's the axis around the uh, around which most of the dysfunction in the anti-death penalty movement involves. It's this myth that the black community is is for the death. That's, I don't know what poll you took or what you read, but that's not true. And that's, that's pretty much the fundamental reason why you can't get anything done in the death penalty, in the anti-death penalty. Because that right there, it drives the whole notion and the whole rationale for the way we organize against the death penalty. The black community historically has been against the death penalty because the, the death penalty is lynching. And Ida B. Wells was a person who brought that paradigm into play. Okay, that's what is most significant about Ida B. Wells. Before Ida B. Wells, you had one of my favorite his, uh, historical figures, Frederick Douglass. He was a very good friend of Ida B. Wells. He was a good mentor of hers. And he was a very powerful advocate against racism and lynching and so forth. But he was pretty compliant. So was Booker T. Washington. He did some very good things. The Tuskegee Institute recorded the lynching. Okay. But it was Ida B. Wells who came on the scene and actually challenged lynching and, and asked people to protest it and, <coughs> and actually challenged the system. So that, that's the Ida B. Wells part. The other uh, point I want to make to bring to, uh, to the fore is the guilt or innocence. We can't pursue this uh, movement against the death penalty looking at it from that construct, guilt or innocence. Because again, if you look at, uh, let's say a person uh, kills somebody and another person kills somebody, one of them might get executed, one of them might not. So you can't really look at it from that, that, that alone kind of gives us reason not to look at it from that perspective. Um, the, the leadership, question is very important, but let's go to the uh, racism within the, in, within the movement. The organizations don't really reflect the, the people who are most victimized by racism. Okay, and again, if, you, if you're sitting around at a table or in a movement meeting with people who are against the death penalty, that's, the pre, that's pretty much the perception. I'm not going to go and talk to a preacher okay, for my politics and my ideology don't allow me to do it. I'm not going to go and try to get the sororities involved because that's not really what I'm about. You know, and it's all those different groups within the great that make up the black community that people within the anti-death penalty movement are not reaching out to. And that's how you don't, that's why you have such a stagnated uh, movement. The way I got involved in the movement was a uh, person was on death row, a young male. He was uh, underage when he was uh, sentenced to death. His name was, uh, Gary Graham, but he, he later changed his name to Shaka Senko. And the whole city was riveted when they were getting ready to execute him. Everybody in the city that, was, that I knew was against the death penalty at that moment. And that's how I got involved. I was just a person who was an academic. I was uh, you know, working on my thesis uh, at the time. And I was involved in activism. I've been to Philadelphia organized you know, for Reverend Jesse Jackson and been all over the country doing things of that nature. I was, in a I was in a political office at that time. But I walked out of that political office and got involved, just went to a meeting uh, that was on the date of a hearing for him to get an execution day. And it was just completely dysfunctional. I called a minister and I asked him for a thousand dollars so they could have buses to go to Austin. And it was done just like that. We, we were not going to get people to Austin if I wouldn't have done that. Okay, so I, that's how I kind of got involved. In it. And then from 2003 until 2006, I was pretty much just an average person going to the meetings and so forth. But I didn't want to get too involved. I didn't want to go to Huntsville and get that connected to it. But in 2006, that actually happened. I went to death row in Texas, and I met 
uh, Gary Graham. And at that point, there became a personal connection. And what I've learned and what I've seen from the death penalty movement and, and being in those meetings, I've never, ever have seen some of the people that we look to as far as leadership around the death penalty. I've never seen anybody like that in a, in a meeting against the death penalty. The people who come to the meetings and who drive the movement against the death penalty are ordinary people who have in some kind of way been touched by it happening to someone perhaps in their family. So you have to, and then they, they go from there and they network. And then I remember, really quickly, I'll was, I was shut up. <laughs> but I remember um, we, even on the national level, working with Mumia, him having the first execution day. They were going to execute him, I think, on August 17th. Yeah, and so uh, we had a leadership meeting at that point, the National Association for a Leadership Summit or something. We had all the African American leaders in the country there. And I remember uh, building with uh, Brother Daruba. Ben Wahad at that point, and spending a whole week lobbying those leaders to uh, stand against the death penalty for Mumia Abu Jamal. I can remember uh, Ramona Africa having her come down to Texas uh, when Mumia uh, wrote the book uh, Live from Death Row. I, I, I keep forgetting, Pam, were you with Ramona when you came down there? Texas. No. You were not there. So it was somebody who was another sister who came with Ramona. And I remember, and that's how we kind of built these networks that uh, the people who, you know, connected with us, that's how we kind of built these networks. The people who were directly impacted by it and not, uh, I guess, territorial and paternalistic and so forth in such a way that they would not reach out beyond themselves. I can remember very quickly the last don't, you're not going to run me out here with this one, but I can remember at the last moment when we were trying to save Shaka and Coach's life, uh, how much it meant to have Pat Robinson, you know, supporting Shaka and Coach. So you have to go and you have to build beyond just these groups that we typically have, the same people acquire, and go beyond that. And I think the approach, though, know, is you think that the African American community is, again, you know, Support the death penalty. I can't see how we're going to build anything from that. Let's give LB a big round of applause. We must be dealing with the same issue with our next panelist, Sandra Jones, talking about the death penalty, talking about Ivy Wells, and incorporating anything else in connection with today's topics slavery, black laws, contract labor, lynching, Jim Crow, and the prison industrial conflict. Thank you. Well, Elmi is absolutely right about um, black support for the death penalty. It is far less than it is um, among the white community. Uh, polls from the Pew Forum on Public and Religious Life have found 68%, um, although I think it's gone down to more like 66% of white Americans supporting the death penalty, in contrast with 40% of African Americans. It's roughly 48% for Latinos, but the fact remains that the majority of black and Latino um, residents and you know, citizens of this country are opposed to the death penalty. But Michael, Michael's point is still one that we need to talk about. Why is it those um, within the black community do support it? We did hit on one theory that I think is important. They are more often the victims of crime and they want some um, just, you know, they want some compensation for that. They want to be recognized as victims of crime. Um, and but sadly, I think as many of us, not just you know, the black community, but across this country, you buy into this illusion that the death penalty is going to make you safer and it's, it's recognizing the pain of the murder victims, but it does not make us safer at all. In fact, um, if you look at the research, it's so easy to oppose the death penalty, in my view, because uh, the states that do have the death penalty have a higher murder rate. Um, the states without the death penalty have a lower murder rate, and you can even break that down to the county. Harris County, I'm sure, I'll be as familiar, is where, in Texas, where most of the death penalty cases arise, and that's also got a higher murder rate. I mean, you can break it down um, to not only the, the states and the counties that have the executions or that, that send people to death row, but when executions occur, you have to make, draw a distinction between death penalty states and high executed states. As we know, there's 700 people on death row in California, but they're not a high executed state. Um, so, but when you look at the states, particularly the South, that are quick to execute, you see a higher murder rate still. So that's just one, you know, debunking the whole deterrence argument. But you go right down the line, every argument that supports the death penalty is a myth. It is um, an illusion. But we buy into it. Why? Because it's sold to us um, by politicians 
who are, are beating on, uh, and I think this is important to know, and I appreciate Michael bringing this up earlier, um, we are angry when there's been a tragic, horrible loss, particularly of a, of a child, you know, who's an innocent um, being, and, and we wonder, you know, how could somebody do something like that? And, and of course, politicians are, are all too quick to jump in and feed on that, that fresh grief of a community, and to capitalize upon that, and sell us this bill of goods that they're going to be tough on crime, and they're going to make us safer, and this is not going to happen any longer. And, and we don't know any different because the, the facts around the death penalty are not typically portrayed outside of settings like this in a larger community. So we grab onto that because we, you know, in our communities, we want to believe that we're going to be safer. Um, but it is, you know, obviously not making us safer, and it is um, uh, problematic. Um, I'd like to emphasize um, more connections between Ida B. Wells and her work and the death penalty, and that um, when you look at uh, lynchings and by county and by state and then executions, they come down parallel okay, when you look at contemporary executions since the death penalty was reinstated in 76. And there's a few statements I wanted to read that, um, that point to the blatant racism of the movement, which by the way, and I appreciate Ellie starting this conversation as well, um, our movement again is too reluctant to focus upon because we feel like those arguments are not going to sell, but we've got to be bold and courageous like I do and call them out when they occur. Um, being here in Philadelphia, many of you are familiar with the case of Mamiya, of course, and you recall hearing Judge Sabo having said in front of uh, court stenographer Terry Merrill Carter, I'm going to help him cry later. Okay, so that that's not a great um, comment, an example of um, the death penalty being used as a form of lynching. Others are heard all too often across in the courtrooms across our country. Um, for instance, many of you, and I'm sure LB um, and and certainly our exonerees are familiar with the case of Clarence Bradley in Texas. Um, Clarence Bradley was an innocent man on, on death row for many years who was luckily exonerated, uh, been exonerated, but when he was sentenced, the quote was, some of you may have heard, one of you is going to hang for this since you're the nigger you're elected. Okay. These words were spoken by a Texas police officer to Clarence Bradley, who was charged with the murder of a white high school girl. He was exonerated in 1992 years on death row. Um, in preparing for the penalty phase of an African American defendant's trial, a white judge in Florida said in open court, quote, since the nigger mom and dad are here anyway, why don't we go ahead and do the penalty phase today instead of having to subpoena them back at the cost of the state? Um, Anthony Peake was sentenced to death, and the sentence was upheld by the Florida Supreme Court in 86 when he was claim of racial bias. A prosecutor in Alabama was, as, gave, gave us this reason for striking several potential jurors the fact that they were affiliated with the Alabama State University, a predominantly black institution. Um, this pretext was considered race neutral by the reviewing court. Um, during, and I could go on and on, but one more in 87, the election campaign for Philadelphia's DA, it was revealed, you have certainly heard about this uh, around the case, that one of the candidates had produced assistant DA a training video for new prosecutors in which he instructed them about who to exclude from the jury, noting that, quote, young black women are very bad on the jury. Okay? Um, uh, and that blacks from low-income areas are less likely to convict. This training tape was used to, uh, for new recruits on how to hide the racial motivation for their jury. I mean, there's, these are some, uh, selection of all too often cases, and by the way, even defense attorneys who are supposed to be representing these men and women on outside of Michael Court is an exception. Of course, he's a phenomenal defense attorney, but I'm sure he can speak to this as well, that there have been others on the other end of the spectrum who have actually uh, I've seen letters written to um, their uh, clients that they represented that had used racial, racist language. So these are the people who are supposed to be representing our, our guys, which we hear, you know, the sleeping lawyer syndrome, the, you know, the, the drunk lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. And the defense attorney, I'm sorry, I'm not really the separate clause. Um, so um, we, you know, again, I think that we need to be mindful of the fact that in the face of the fact that there are more, um, 50% of homicide victims come from the black community. Okay? Um, we need to look at the fact that not only are there disproportionate numbers of men, large numbers, some women on death row from black and Latino communities, but even more significant than that is the, the race of the victims of people on death row. Okay? Upwards of 80, even sometimes 90% of them, depending upon where you live in this country, of the people on death row have white victims, whereby 50% of homicide victims are black. So the, the message is what? It's not even really that implicit. It's a pretty explicit message. You know, you cross, particularly cross racial lines, by the way. 
if you're a person of color and you kill a white person, um, any defense attorney will say that's one of the things they want to know in terms of either the race of their client versus the race of, of the victim in terms of how difficult the case is going to be to um, try and get them um, off of death row. So we need to look at that too. The way that black and Latino or think of persons of color, the way that their lives are valued and relative to white lives um, in terms of who's victimized. Um, but we need to educate all of us, whether not just communities of color, but all of us, the, the bad um, bill of goods that were being sold by politicians in terms of the death penalty. Because when you really look at it, it is so easy. And Thurgood Marshall himself said he was convinced, you know, that the Marshall hypothesis is that people really knew the death penalty and all the flaws that they would so easily come down against it. For me, you know, coming from Virginia, a high executing state, I had no idea there was a movement um, to fight the death penalty. I would have been involved before I came up here. And it was um, my um, contact with uh, a woman in my cohort at Temple, an uh, African American woman, um, I mean, you may know, Amanda Thurston, who was very heavily involved in the anti death penalty movement, who brought me to a meeting. She said, Oh, you should come to a meeting against death. I'm like, Really? There's a movement? And that's when I said, Well, absolutely, I'm going to I went to that meeting expecting to be the only white person in the room because my reason for being opposed at that time, although I have many other reasons since, was the racial bias involved. So I expected having you know, been an anti-racist in the South and being used to being the racial minority of these sort of anti-racist gatherings to find that I would be the only white person in the room. And the opposite was the case. My friend was the only African-American in the room, and there are largely white um, middle-class professionals. But the problem is they're arguing against the death penalty from a religious, moral, Brain. They're not entertaining racial and political ones. I'm just suggesting we need to be bolder and take on those frames because they are reality. And that will mobilize more persons of color into the movement and make those connections. Trying to save my guy's life. 
and I'm looking at that black potential juror, and I'm looking at that white potential juror. And I'm not going to say automatically that I want that black juror. So we've got to be careful unless you're in the real world dealing with real cases. I'm not saying that every black person supports the death penalty. I'm saying that in my experience, in my experience for the past 20 years, in teaching criminal justice, in being a radio talk show host dealing with the criminal law, I see something different from what the other panelists say, but that's neither here nor there. Let's get to the real point. I told you I was going to make three key arguments about why the death penalty is wrong. The first argument, if you believe in a God, you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, you're a Jew, whatever, then you believe that a creator created everybody. So you, you are destroying God's creation. So you can't be a man of God or a woman of God that supports the death penalty because if you do, you're going against your God. Those are the people who believe, uh, who believe in God. The second argument is, if you believe in the whole eye for an eye concept, you say that, okay, murderers should be murdered. The, first, the, the question I pose to you is this. Does that therefore mean we should kidnap kidnappers? That we should rob robbers? Even better, this is the question I pose to the advocates of death penalty. You can never give me a response. Forget about robbing robbers. Forget about kidnapping kidnappers. Why don't we rape rapists? Well, we hire a state executioner to shoot up people with a lethal injection for the death penalty. Why don't we hire a state employee to rape rapists? People are like, wow, that's pretty uncivilized. Exactly. So if we're so shocked by the idea of a state employee raping rapists, why are we not shocked by a state employee killing killers? And then the third argument doesn't so much oppose the death penalty as it does oppose the application of it. In civil cases, if you hit me with your car and you break my legs and I sue you in civil court, once we go in civil court, the burden of proof is what they call it, preponderance of the evidence, a little bit more than that. So I come in, I say you did it, you come in, you say you didn't do it. It's about 51%, 49%. The jury believes him more than me, he wins. They believe me more than him, I win. About preponderance, who has slightly more. In civil case, that's the burden of proof, preponderance of the evidence. In a criminal case, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. So I say to the death penalty advocates, why don't we take it up to a, a notch in the penalty phase of a death penalty case? If it's a preponderance in a civil case, if it's beyond a reasonable doubt in a criminal case, why don't we make it absolute certainty to kill the guy? I mean, give him life if you can't show it on videotape, if you can't show uh, a full confession. Anybody who supports the death penalty, they can't oppose that argument. Because it's one thing to put a guy in jail for 10 years, okay, I made a mistake, my bad, let him out, give him $100,000, $10 million, whatever. But now you've killed the man, you've killed the woman. What do you do about that? So again, for anybody who might support the death penalty, what do you say to my argument that Upon the evidence in civil cases, beyond a reasonable doubt in criminal cases, why not make it an absolute certainty in death penalty cases? One move. Um, I have to agree that blacks in the death penalty <coughs> is the number is larger, I mean, against the death penalty is larger in the white community than it is in people of color in dealing with the issue of the death penalty. In um, the early 80s, when I got involved with dealing with the issue of the death penalty, um, at the American Friends uh, Service Committee with Brother Bill Meeks, uh, Linda Thurston, and uh, there was always a room full of black folks who were definitely against the death penalty and you know, wanted to do the work. And when I went to Chicago, um, dealing with the death penalty, Dick Gregory was in town, I was in town, and um, Dick Gregory's room was just about empty. And we were doing an anti-death penalty program um, dealing with Brother Aaron Patterson and the men. And the room was predominantly black, black people from all walks of life, and all who were willing to work and do the work that is necessary to bring these two brothers home. Um, I've watched the um, issue of the death penalty movement 
you know, from that point on. And when I seen a lot of black folks, you know, involved in the death penalty, and then the numbers started dwindling, and all that's because it's like a deal with the anti-police, you know, um, movement, which is still that uh, anti-death penalty movement. Um, there was huge meetings, and all full of all kinds of people. In fact, we marched on Washington, you know, um, with also police orders of black folks, black cops against, you know, the death, uh, the death penalty and against police brutality. This government looked and seen people coming together in a massive fist up against it. And they knew that they had to do something to stop it. Do you know how many people seen big marches against police brutality lately? Anybody? Large marches against police brutality when somebody is stopped? There is none. I mean, you might have a meeting with a few people, but in massive numbers, people coming together after this government, it's no more. And the reason why that is, is behind the fact that this government, and I'm um, how to divide people by increasing crime, the economics, you know, what's happening here is a division. And uh, when you pick up the paper and you see people that are shot down and uh, um, massive murders are happening in the community and uh, you know within the black community, you have black folks that were once on the front line against the death penalty now are standing back and uh, because it has touched them. And uh, but what they don't understand, it is what they hate. Because if you're truly against mass murder, Someone murdered your mother, your sister, your brother, and all you know, and you know, really appalled at the murder of children, babies. Then why do you allow this government? And I mean, and will thoroughly go quickly after the so-called unschooled, you know, person and all. But you allow people like Smith, French, and Klein, and all you know, pharmaceuticals. If you say you're against drugs, then you push drugs in your school, Prozac, Ritalin. If you say you're against the death penalty, why did you go to the cool jazz festival and all, you know, commemorating murder and all the mothers, the fathers, the sisters, the brothers? Why do you say that you're against the murder of children when children are dying every day from eating polluted Water. You got an acne on this corner, an AMP here, you got an old room here, you got the scenes here. Somebody is committing murder. But do we raise our voices about it? Do we demand that these murders stop? And uh, when you see ambulances going up and down the street on a daily basis, it's not because Joe Blow didn't kill somebody next door to him or Mary that got mad and she's tired of the ass whooping that's being put on her. Yeah, and, uh, uh, you know, by us, oh, okay. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but I'm saying, you know, people will demand, you know, something happened there. But we who say that we are against the death penalty, we, those who say that they're for the death penalty, I'm saying we need to check ourselves. And, uh, and say, you know, understand, this is not a game. If you're against the death penalty, you got to take that all the way across the board. Mm -hmm. All the way across the board. And, uh, you know, and um, Shaka Sankofa, um, we're speaking because, you know, I supported, you did a lot of work around the brother Shaka Sankofa as well. And it became a division in the death penalty as well as it was in the death penalty movement. And, uh, and I was really shocked that there was an article that came out, um, a letter that was written to our, our friends over in France and in Germany, and uh, you know, that in order to keep the funding for the death penalty, uh, anti-death penalty movement, they had to come up with a situation of the anti-death penalty is for everybody but Mumia. I thought that we had comrades that would say, this is bull. How the hell can you be against the death penalty and turn around and say, for everybody but Mumia? Mm -hmm. We were isolated, pushed off to the side, mm -hmm. and all because we refused to deal with that. But money and people thinking that a movement is 
built on money and, uh, and will take money, a paycheck, and sell out the movement. And I'm saying, and that's what happens all the way across the board. And uh, you know, our children were sold out in the streets by paychecks, and uh, which got them in the streets committing murder. And uh, people who, a lot of people commit murder, don't commit it because they want some Gucci, um, whatever, they, whatever Gucci do. And uh, you know, but it's behind, you know, they need food. They really need food. Their children are hungry. They're getting ready to be put out in the street right now somewhere. People are somebody trying to fight and plan, how am I going to rob this person here to feed my family? You know, the issue of the death penalty and Ida B. Wells, she was a magnificent woman, and she is a magnificent woman. She put us all here together today. Um, she went everywhere. Some people say, I don't go into the churches. And uh, in order to fight this fight, you got to go into the churches, you got to go into the bars, you got to go everywhere that there is people at to make them understand that the situation is wrong. Um, hip hop, you know, we went to France, we went to Germany, we went to Cuba. You got to go places that you've never been before to get results that you never had before. The death penalty is wrong. Ida B. Wells is one of my heroes, and I want to say about lynchings, and uh, um, there's a brother that's coming here from Double Bear, and you know, I really want people to embrace this brother. He lost his job as a, pro uh, a professor at Delaware State because he's opposed to black men being lynched in Delaware. This is not something that happened 10 years ago, five years ago. These are things that are happening right now. And when some of his students went to protest about that, they attacked the teacher who stood with his children. We have got to protect people who stand up for us. I find that this teacher is standing by himself because teachers don't want to lose their jobs for speaking up for what is right. I would be well if they didn't give a damn about a job. All she knew that it was wrong. It was wrong what was happening. No one who John Africa has the right to do wrong. But we allow this. We allow people to poison our air, poison our water, poison our soul, and all, which is all death penalty, and all, you know, and allow these people to get away with it. There is something today that we gotta understand about ourselves. What it is that we are willing to do, truth about the death penalty and all these people. Cause don't put in the category of just this little piece here. Let's leave here today with the understanding that this entire system must go down and all for the sake of us all. It's about 3.20 now, so we want to give the panelists a chance to offer some solutions. Then we'll turn the microphone over to the audience. Hey guys. Uh, let me just say a, a few words and I, I'm going to pass it on. It's not just the death penalty that bothers me, that makes me fight. It's the criminal justice system. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's called the criminal justice system that failed me to do. I was convicted and sentenced to die. What made it possible for me to be released? I'm not here because of the system. It's in spite of the system. It was two young white kids when I went off the death row. They said, Suja, we're going to get you out of here. Said, Some days they didn't go to trial. During my first trial, they didn't go to school. They attended my trial. Then my second trial, they attended it. Then I was convicted to die at San Point on peace of They were the first one that came up to see me. 
this is who y'all gonna be traveling. And I said to myself then, what can some young kids do against the power of the state of California? Look at that number. Those young children left that penitentiary and went out into society, knocked on every door, sold cookies, and next thing I know, I had all types of law volunteers that got me. So we just got to go and not just talk about the death penalty. And you would think, after some green courts, I'm going to show you the racism. My jury was all white. My first trial, I had one black juror on me. You know, kept the British white. I went off the death row, they overturned my conviction based on the systematic exclusion of African Americans off of my jury. That was African Americans on my jury, I never kicked an African American off of my jury. I didn't care if they were for the death row. Some of them followed with police officers and prosecutors. We left them on the jury, but no who kicked them off? The prosecutor. Know why he kicked them off? Because he had all these racist white boys coming there talking about all black people looking alike who came here to testify. They were paid to testify against us. So he figured African Americans would be turned off by that. But you would think so supreme, because the Supreme Court of California said that you can't do this, you would think I was there to fight jury. Black people go on my jury. My third trial, it was a home jury, all white. He kicked off every black. And it was there in my fourth trial where I got tired of just trying to figure out who was who. It was one particular person on that jury, I believe, and he was a white man. And my lawyer didn't like him because he was very conservative. And he kept kicking people off the jury and came back to this particular person. My lawyer said, let's get rid of Mr. Bank of America, the vice president of Southern. I said, no, Mr. Lawson, there's something about this man. I said, I can't offer deep philosophical explanation of why I want him on my jury. But I can say that I think he's a fair and decent person. And we left him on the jury. And fortunate enough, he took off the jury and he led the campaign to get my release. And when I was released from prison, I experienced a lot of hardship. I'm a survivor of torture. I stayed in solitary confinement for nine years. That's what we do. Like Tupac Williams said, I had an opportunity one time to getting ahead of myself and talk to murder victims down there. And it made me question my commitment. As I looked at these people and their sons and daughters had been killed, it made me think, what if it happened to my daughter? Could I still take this position? I had to work on myself to deal with that. But it made me a better person. And it's not because they wasn't against it. It wasn't because they didn't love their loved one. It's a suit job. When it happened, I could have killed them a hundred times. Mm. That's how I am. Mm. Like one of the victims told me, he said, Suja, everybody in the world expects to bury their parents, but no one. And you bury your parents on the hills and you go on with your life. But no one expects to bury their children. When the children are murdered, you bury them in your heart. And that's what we got to get out the whole idea of using the death penalty as a form of punishment. Like Tookie Williams said before he died, he said, what's the difference between a state that murders and a murder? Mm -hmm. And a murder. And the predetermined outcome is orchestrated death. He said, when someone robbed you, do you rob the robbery as a form of punishment? Of course not. But well, why was someone killed? We have to kill to prove that killing is wrong. I think we can create a better society and make a better place if we come together and start educating each and every individual in this world. And last but not least, let me say this. They are supposed to buy them. They are supposed to murder that was executed. That was just a wonderful word. And I, I always like to leave it with people. And sometimes people feel sorry for me. Because I get up here and struggle. But don't feel sorry for me. I'm okay. The words go something like this. And the most happiest of people don't necessarily have the best of things. They just make the best out of what comes their way. Mm. Happiness comes to those who fight, those who struggle, and surely to those who have served. The only thing we can appreciate the importance of those who have touched their lives. We can't go on well in life, America, until we overcome our past failures, heartaches, and disappointments. The most brightest of future would always be based on a forgiven or forgotten past. Most of you all, when you were born, everyone around you were probably smiling and you were crying. Go on out and live your life so that when you die, you'll be the one that smiles and everyone around you will be crying. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
death row for 11 years. 11 years. Let's just pause for 11 seconds, quietly, just 11 seconds, and multiply that 11 seconds by minutes, and by hours, and by days, and by months, and by years, and real, and thinking that at the end of those 11 years, the state is going to murder you. Let's be quiet for at least this 11 seconds. And again, it's just 11 seconds, but the hell that he went through, he is the manifestation or the personification of what we're fighting against. We can talk about this stuff all day long, but he went through that hell. And I still hear the voices now. Dead man walking every time I move. Dead man walking to chain me down. Dead man, I wasn't sued John Glenn. Go get the condemned. Go get the dead man. I'm walking in San Quentin, all the guards surround me. I said, why are y'all surrounding me? You don't want nobody to kill me. I said, y'all don't kill me. I'm going today. Don't worry about me. I'm not afraid of those prisoners. Just stand in the circle with the ground. And it makes you feel like you're nothing. You walk out there and change it just like you all. They're walking through general population. They put it down the gun and put the gun on and tell everybody in the yard. Dead man walking. All the prisoners get against the wall. And you feel like nothing. All you hear is dead man, dead man. Dead man, that's all we hear to condemn. I still hear those voices now. We got to end all of this stuff. It's all about get out of the revenge and retaliation. We've been doing it all our life, and all we're doing is multiplying violence. Education, education, education. I'm sorry. <laughs>